Drafting Room, Atlantic Express Depot, 1959. There was meant to be a maintenance team here instead of me, Bill groused as he bent to examine the cracks in the curved metal wall of the maintenance runoff tunnel. They had some git of a splicer was going to creep up the walls and fix the leaks they couldn't reach. Don't know what became of the buggers. Karlowski grunted. I think I see your maintenance team. Bill stood up, walked over to Karlowski. Together they looked through a window into the mailroom of Jet Postal. The shadowy, indirectly lit room was scattered with undelivered mail. And with bodies. Several bodies. Men in maintenance coveralls lying about on the floor motionless. Pasted to the deck with their own blood. They seemed to have been hacked up by some sharp blade. Bill sighed, stomach contracting at the sight. Yeah, I don't see that splicer. Maybe... Karlowski nodded musingly, patting the breech of his tommy gun. Not good workers, those splicers, he said dryly. They go crazy, they kill. A man does not get job done with busy being crazy and killing. After a moment he shrugged and added, but less killing is the job. Well, I'm going to make a list of cracks and leaks and get a team in here with a constable escort, Bill said. We can't risk... He Look, broke Mr. off, Pebbles. staring at a small figure it's in a pinafore. Angel. A child, moving through the shadows of the jet postal sorting area. Steel boots clanked. A great metal shape loomed up behind her. A big daddy and a little sister. She skipped along, a large syringe in one hand, singing a song they couldn't clearly hear. Something about Mr. Bubbles and the angels. Her enormous chaperone stumped along close behind her. Bill and Karlowski watched with an uneasy mix of fascination and revulsion as the little girl squatted by a man's awkwardly sprawling face-down corpse and jammed the syringe into the back of his neck. She did something with the syringe, chirruping happily to herself, and it began to glow with extracted atom. Bill stepped closer to the window and bent over to peer at the little sister. Karlowski. Is it that Mashka? Karlowski groaned to himself. Yes. Maybe, maybe not. All little sisters look much alike to me. If it's her, I owe it to her folks to get her back. We tried, Bill. You spoke to many people. No one would help. That's why I've got to do this myself. Right now. Please, don't argue with Big Daddy, Bill. Oh, there's a splicer. A spider splicer was creeping upside down on the ceiling over the little sister. He had a hooked blade in one hand. He was chattering to himself. The intervening pane of glass muted the sound. The little sister stood up, turned toward the Big Daddy. Then a blade spun past her, whipping through the air like a boomerang. The blade narrowly missed her head, so close it cut a bit of her hair, which drifted prettily away. <laughs> the weapon circled the room and returned to the splicer, who caught the blade handle neatly, cackling as he did it. The little sister's guardian reacted instantly. The big daddy stepped into a pool of light, raised a rivet gun to aim at the ceiling, and fired a long strafe of rivets at the spider splicer. The gun nailed its target at such close range it cut the splicer in half. The spider splicer's lower half and its upper half clung to the ceiling, separately by feet and hands. The two halves gushed blood, then they let go, and the halves of the splicer dropped heavily to the floor. The little girl chirruped happily. <laughs> you got him! You'll see, Karlowski whispered. If you interfere with her, you end up like him. I've got to try, Bill said. Maybe if you distract him, I can grab her. Oh shit, Bill, you son of a bitch bastard, Karlowski said and muttered another imprecation in Russian. You get me killed. I've got faith in you give for self-preservation, mate. Come on. Bill led the way to the door of the jet postal sorting room. He hesitated, 
wondering what Elaine would want him to do. She would want Mosca rescued, if this little sister was, in fact, Mashka. But Elaine wouldn't want him to risk himself this way. Still, there probably wouldn't be another chance. He opened the door, then stepped back, crouching down to one side, signaling to Karlowski. Do it, then run. Karlowski swore in Russian once more, but he raised his Tommy gun and fired a short burst toward the Big Daddy. A burst from a Tommy gun wasn't going to kill it, and Karlowski wouldn't risk the wrath of his employers by destroying the valuable cyborg, but it got the Big Daddy's attention. The lumbering metal golem turned and rushed like an accelerating freight train at the source of the assault. Karlowski was already running, cursing Bill as he went. The Big Daddy clanged past Bill, not seeing him crouching by the door. Bill slipped behind the metal guardian and through the door, seeing the little girl standing up from the extraction, blood-dripping syringe in her hand. She looked at him with big eyes, mouth opened in a round O. Was this Mashka? He wasn't sure. Mr. Bubbles, she called. There's a bad man in here wanting to be turned into an angel. Mashka, Bill said. Is that you? He took a step towards her. Listen, I'm going to pick you up, but I won't hurt you. Then a metal clumping close behind Bill turned his blood cold. He spun around just in time to be struck across the chest. The Big Daddy returned to protect its charge, swinging the weapon in its hand like a club. Bill was knocked backward, off his feet. The air smacked from his lungs, the room whirling. Gasping, he lost consciousness for a few moments. When the spinning specks formed shapes and the room coalesced, he looked dizzily around, saw that he was sitting up on the floor, back against a bulkhead. The Big Daddy and his little charge were nowhere to be seen. Bill got up, moaning to himself with the pain of his bruised chest, and staggered to the door. He was met by Karlowski. You okay, Bill? Yeah. Oh, good to see you alive. I thought I'd got you killed. Huh. <laughs> no. I outsmart that steel bastard. Look. He pointed across the open space of the depot on the far wall. The little girl was climbing into one of the key-shaped Art Deco apertures that the little sisters used to enter hidden passageways. They scuttled through the passageways to take their scavenged Adam back to Ryan's laboratories. Mashka or not Mashka, he would never know. She simply vanished into the wall. The Big Daddy waited quietly by the big Art Deco keyhole for his little sister to return. Bill shook his head and turned away, grimacing with pain, and wanted only to get back to Elaine. Once more, his determination to escape rapture was underscored. He had to get his family back to the surface, back to blue sky and sunlight and freedom. Medical Pavilion Aesthetic Ideals Surgery, 1959. Ryan and Adam. Adam and Ryan. All those years of study, and was I ever truly a surgeon before I met them? How we plinked away with our scalpels and toy morality. Yes, we could lop a boil here, shave down a beak there, but could we really change anything? No. But Adam gives us the means to do it and Ryan frees us from the phony ethics that held us back. Change your look, change your sex, change your race. It's yours to change, nobody else's. Wearing a blood-soaked surgical gown and white surgeon's cap, his hands in rubber gloves, Dr. J.S. Steinman hit pause on the little tape recorder that he'd wedged between the blonde patient's ample breasts, then pushed the gurney, its wheels Surstering through the hollow water that had leaked across the floor of surgery. He hummed to himself, singing an ink spot song, If I Didn't Care, over the muffled moaning of the patient he'd strapped to the little wheeled bed. Would I be sure that this is love beyond compare? Would all this be true if I didn't care? For 
for you. He pushed the woman into place under the glaring surgical light and reached into his coat pocket for his favorite scalpel. Tiresome to do without a nurse, but he'd had to kill Nurse Chavez when she'd started whining about his efforts to please Aphrodite, threatening to turn him into the constables. Of course, he hadn't killed her till he'd done some fine experimentation on her doll-like visage. He still had Chavez's face in a refrigerator somewhere, along with some others he'd peeled off and saved in preservative jars. Faces from patients who'd given their lives for his perfect fusion of art and science. He really must try to organize his preserved faces with a filing system. Steinman paused to admire this latest woman writhing in her restraints on the gurney. She'd used some low-grade plasmid to help her hack a gambling machine in Fort Frolic, and his fellow artist, Sander Cohen, who owned the casino, had caught her. It was getting hard to find voluntary patients. He did think he might get Diane McClintock to come in again. He longed to alter her in another manner entirely, according to his artistic whim, to give her a truly transcendent face. He might get hold of a telekinesis plasmid and use it to form her face from within, shape it telekinetically into something lovely. They were all so ugly, honestly so plain, they didn't try hard enough to make themselves fitting vessels for Aphrodite. But they're filthy, filthy at the core, he muttered. No knife was sharp enough to cut that filth out. He tried and tried and tried, but they were always so fat or short. Plain. Steinman made a tisk sound as the blonde woman shrieked unintelligibly at him through the gag. Some insult, perhaps. My dear, I'd love to give you some anesthetic to grace your experience. I really would. But I have quite run out of it, and... Anyway, there's something less aesthetically pleasing about sculpting and unconscious patient. If they are unconscious, the blood hardly spurts at all. Their eyes don't have that look of possession by the god of terror. And how satisfying could that be now, I ask you? I may have to stop and have some more Adam and a touch of Eve myself. Oh, do try to accept this, my dear. Appreciate it as a sacrificial aesthetic experience. A sacrifice to Aphrodite. Sander Cohen and I have talked about doing a performance on stage with one of my little surgeries. Can you imagine? A face sculpting set to original music. The trouble is, of course, he bends near his wild-eyed patient to whisper confidentially. The trouble is, my dear, Sander Cohen is quite insane. Mad. Out of his mind. <laughs> I shouldn't socialize with Cohen, that loony tune. I have my reputation to think of. He hit record on the tape recorder and cleared his throat to set down another immortal memo. With genetic modifications, beauty is no longer a goal, or even a virtue. It is a moral obligation. Still, Adam presents new problems for the professional, he said for the audio diary. As your tools improve, so do your standards. There was a time I was happy enough to take off a wart or two, to turn a real circus freak into something you could show in the daylight. So saying, he started carving deeply into the face of the woman on the gurney, glad he'd taken the trouble to brace her head in place because she was shaking so much with agony as he sliced away her cheeks. He went on, but that was then when we took what we got. But with Adam, the flesh becomes clay. What excuse do we have not to sculpt and sculpt and sculpt until the job is done? He hit pause on the tape recorder, its buttons becoming slippery with the blood on his hands, and considered his work. It was hard to tell through all the blood and torn tissue. My dear, I believe I'm going to give you some Adam. That will regrow your face into another shape entirely. Then I'll carve the new tissue some more. Then I'll regrow some more face on you with Adam. Then I'll carve that some more. Then... Another muffled shriek from the woman. He sighed, shaking his head. 
They just would not understand. He hit record again and accompanied his next wet, spurting spate of carving with a kind, artistic manifesto. When Picasso became bored of painting people, he started representing them as cubes and other abstract forms. The world called him a genius. I've spent my entire surgical career creating the same tired shapes. Over and over again. The upturned nose, the cleft chin, the ample bosom. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I could do with a knife what that old Spaniard did with a brush? Steinman hit pause again, used his left hand to wipe some blood from the recorder buttons. He returned to his patient, only to find she died on him. Oh damn it, not another one. Blood loss and shock, he supposed, as usual. It was really quite unfair. They'd always left him too soon. It made him angry to think of their selfishness. He slashed at her in his fury, knocking the tape recorder on the floor, cutting her throat into ribbons. Long, pretty ribbons, which he then tied into bows. When he calmed down enough to be precise, he exposed her breasts and cut them into shapes, like the sea anemones that waved in the gentle currents, so restfully, so gracefully, outside the window of his office. Ah, he thought, the rapture of the deep. Fighting McDonough's Bar, 1959. When? It had to be soon. He was going to have to escape from rapture with Elaine and their daughter. And if that meant killing... Bill. Bill McDonough nearly leapt from his bar stool when Redgrave spoke at his elbow. Blowing me. Don't sneak up on a man like that. Redgrave smiled sadly. Sorry. Something you ought to know, though. Your woman who cleans the rooms, she found something. Bill sighed. He tossed down his brandy, nodded to his bartender. Just close down when you feel like it, mate. He got off the bar stool. All right, let's have it, Redgrave. You've been letting out some of your rooms, ain't you? Number seven. That was the Lutzes. Sure. I don't charge him for it. Christ, their little girl went missing on my watch. He couldn't resist a cold look at Redgrave. On your watch, too. Redgrave grimaced. We only looked away a couple of seconds. We were watching for splices. I know, I know. Forget it. What about Sam Lutz? Come on. Feeling leaden, Bill went with Redgrave to the tavern's back rooms. Number seven's combination door was open. He stepped in and immediately saw the two of them, stretched out on the mattress, on their backs, side by side. Two corpses, holding hands, barely recognizable as Mariska and Samuel Lutz. There were a couple of empty pill bottles lying on the floor nearby. The sunken eyes of the cadavers were closed, eyelids like wrinkled parchment, their faces yellow and emaciated. The shriveling of death had given their lips the same pinched expression of disapproval, as if they were silently judging all the living. They wore their best clothes, he noticed. Suicide. And there's this. He pointed, beside the bodies was one of the ubiquitous tape recorders. Bill pressed play on the tape recorder. Mariska Lutz's voice came distant and tinny from the little recorder as if speaking across the gulf of death. We saw Armashka today. We barely recognized her. That's her? Sam said. <laughs> You're crazy, I told him. That thing? That is Armashka? But he was right. She was throwing blood out of a corpse, and when she was done, she walked off hand in hand with one of those awful golems. Our Mashka! Bill stopped the recording. Redgrave cleared his throat. Well, I expect they knew they couldn't get her back. She was already gone, you know, changed so much, so they... He gestured limply at the pill bottles. Bill nodded. Yeah, just, uh... Just leave him here. I'll seal it up. 
This will be the crypt for now. Redgrave stared at him, as if he might object. Then he shrugged. Whatever you say. He looked back at the bodies. We only looked away for, for a moment or two. He shook his head and walked out, leaving Bill alone with the dead. Atlas HQ, Hestia, 1959. Walking up to Atlas's office, Diane was still sweaty, shaky from the raid. She'd had some training from Atlas's guerrillas, and she was almost used to slipping through the wire, waiting as the other team created the decoy, dashing past Ryan's men. More than once, she'd followed the other guerrillas up a side passage, up the stairs, through some old maintenance passage, all of them carrying GI backpacks to fill with supplies stolen from one of the constable armories. But this time, when the guards broke in on them, just as they finished their harvest of the ammo, and just as Sorensen got control of the Big Daddy, the chaos had been exhilarating and nightmarish at once. Firing her own pistols, one in each hand, her heart slamming with each shot, she'd watched a constable go down, shrieking, dying. I've killed a man. She'd cringed from blazing return fire, seen three of her comrades falling. She decided now to record some of her impressions on her audio diary. She had decided she was going to be the historian of the revolution. She switched the recorder on with trembling hands as she walked along. We went on a raid outside the wire today. We snagged 31 rounds of buckshot, 4 frag grenades, a shotgun, and 34 Adam. We lost McGee, Epstein, and Vallette. She swallowed hard at that. She'd particularly liked Vallette. Too easy to reel off a list of the dead. The Butcher's Bill, the guerrillas called it. She went on. We got one of those goddamn big daddies in the bargain, though. Something awful they had to do to that little girl to get the atom, but... We didn't start this thing. Ryan did. I can't wait to tell Atlas. He'll be so pleased. Diane stepped into Atlas's office to let him know they'd gotten the big daddy and stared in surprise at a stranger sitting at Atlas's desk. He seemed to be recording an audio diary of his own. After a breathless moment, he was no longer a stranger. She hadn't recognized him at first. The cold, cynical expression on his face and that sneering voice talking of long cons made it seem impossible that he could be anyone but Frank Fontaine. He turned a look of angry shock at her, then put on Atlas's expression. His voice became Atlas's. Miss McClintock, what are you doing here? Let me just... He dropped the Atlas pretense, shaking his head, seeing in her face that she knew, finishing in Frank Fontaine's voice. Turn this off. He switched off the tape recorder. It occurred to her that she should run, She'd found out something he would kill to keep secret. But her feet seemed frozen to the floor. She was barely able to speak. They, they trusted you. How could you let them die? For a lie? Fontaine stalked toward her, drawing a buck knife, opening it with a practiced motion, the blade making a snick sound as it flicked into readiness. It doesn't matter, kid, he said. Because it's all lies. Everything is. Except for... Then she felt the cold blade slash upward into her belly, just under the ribcage. This. Rapture Central Control. 1959. Bill McDonough paced up and down in the passageway outside Central Control. The constables at the entrance to the hall had been friendly, glad to see him, not knowing his mission. He had to make his move, and soon, then signal Wallace to take the mini-sub up to the boat. Conditions were as good as they were ever going to be for escape. The city's turbulence indicators showed the sea was fairly calm right now. Ryan's men were dealing with a new disruption concentrated in sealing off Apollo Square, there weren't many of Ryan's bunch between here and the lighthouse. Roland Wallace wouldn't take the mini-sub unless Bill gave him the signal. 
but there was something he'd have to do then about Ryan and Rapture. He made up his mind that if he succeeded today in Ryan's office, he would send his family to safety, but stay in Rapture, at least for a time, then try to create new leadership and make a peace deal with Atlas. He had helped build this place. He felt an obligation to the survivors. Eventually, he could rejoin Elaine and Sophie. The survivors. Quite a surprising number of people had died here or been executed. Ryan was starting to put the corpses up on stakes at the entryway to central control. Rapture had become a police state. It had turned into its own opposite. Bill let out a long, slow breath reached into his pocket for the pistol, checked the load for the fourth time, put it back in his blazer. Could he do this? Then he remembered Sam and Mariska Lutz. Got to face it all, man, he told himself. Got to be done, I'm sorry. He put the pistol back, took out the little radio. He clicked it and murmured into it. Wallace? A crackle then. Yes, Bill. It's time. I am. Going to take care of my business, then bring the family for the picnic. Okay. I'm ready. Meet you there. He put the radio away, heart pounding. He straightened his tie and opened the door. A security camera swiveled to take him in as he stepped through. He had his ID flasher on, and it let him pass without releasing the security bots. Ryan still trusted him. He strode past the crucified corpses, smelling them but steadfastly not looking at them, and went to the door to Ryan's office. He was scanned by a turret, and it let him pass. He reached for the door just as Karlowski came out. Bill almost jumped out of his shoes. Karlowski looked at him curiously. Something making you nervous, Bill? Me? Oh, no. Just them bodies out there. Give me the willies. Karlowski nodded sympathetically. Mm, don't like that decoration either. Sometimes necessary. I'm going to get sandwich for me and Mr. Ryan. You want something? Me? No, I... Christ, how could he eat sandwiches with these bodies stuck up out here? However... Well, yeah, Ivan. Whatever... whatever you're having. The longer Karlowski stayed away, the better. Karlowski nodded and strolled out. Bill went into Ryan's office. Andrew Ryan was standing by the window, gazing out at the sea, leaning on his walking stick. He wore his tailored three-piece gray silk suit, and in that moment, Bill felt his heart go out to him. Ryan had built this brave new world to match his dream, and it had become a nightmare. But Bill reminds himself of those men and women crucified in the outer room, and he took a deep breath and pulled the pistol. Ryan didn't turn around. He seemed to know. Go on. Do it, Bill. If you're man enough. Bill raised the gun, and it trembled in his hand. Ryan turned and smiled sadly. What was it you said, Bill? You'd stay with me from A to Z. Well, we're not quite at Z yet, but it seems you're taking your leave. No, Bill said, his voice breaking. Uh, I'm staying for a while. Can't desert all these people. I helped bring him here. Ryan turned towards him hefting the gold-topped walking stick. Bill, you're a weak link on the great chain, and I cannot leave that weak link in place. Bill aimed the gun as Ryan stalked towards him. His mouth was dry, his pulse thudding. Ryan was almost in reach. A man chooses, Bill. A slave obeys. Choose. Kill me, or obey your cowardice, and run away. Andrew Ryan.
The man who'd plucked him from obscurity, who'd elevated Bill McDonough in this great city, raised the walking stick to strike him down. It was in Ryan's hardened eyes, his twisted mouth. The aging tycoon had every intention of using that gold-headed cane to crush Bill's skull. Shoot him! But Bill couldn't do it. This man had reached down from Olympus and raised him up to Olympus Heights. Andrew Ryan had trusted him. He couldn't. The walking stick came whistling down, and Bill caught it, wincing at the impact as he grabbed it with his left hand. They struggled for a moment, Ryan panting, his teeth bared. And then Bill acted instinctively. He struck down with the butt of the pistol like a club, cracking Andrew Ryan on the forehead. Ryan grunted and fell backward. He lay grasping on the floor, eyes half closed. Bill found that he had the walking stick in his own hand. He dropped it beside Ryan, then knelt and took his pulse. Ryan was stunned, unconscious, but his pulse was strong. Bill knew, somehow, that he would survive intact. Bill squeezed Ryan's hand. I'm sorry, Mr. Ryan. I didn't know what else to do. I can't kill you. Best of luck, Gov. He stood, pistol in hand, and started for the door, walking mechanically, feeling all lumbering and heavy like a big daddy. He stuck the pistol in his pocket and found his way out past the double line of dead man stakes, out past the swiveling camera. He stepped into the hallway, trying not to look like he was in a hurry. He and Elaine and Sophie would have to take a circuitous route. It was a long trek to get to where they were going. He didn't have much time. Karlowski would find Ryan and there would be an alert. Security bots, Ryan's thugs. He had to hurry or lose everything. They were waiting for him in the cemetery, a separate little park off Arcadia. Cemetery near Arcadia, 1959. Burials at sea were cheap, but some preferred Rapture's charming little cemetery. Bill had liked visiting the place, and it was usually deserted, so he'd arranged to meet Elaine and Sophie here. Old-fashioned, rustic in style, the cemetery near Arcadia reminded him of the churchyard where his grandfather was buried. But when he stepped through the archway, he'd found it had lost its charm. Five paces away, a naked man painted blue was hunched threateningly over Elaine and Sophie, who were cowered in front of a tombstone. The man was a Saturnine, one of the pagan cults who'd sprung up in the vacuum of religion in Rapture, sneaking about Starkers to paint their cryptic graffiti, getting high on Adam and coloring themselves blue. Harness the flame! Harness the mist! The man chanted in a grating voice. The blue-painted savage gripped a large kitchen knife in his right hand. Its blade was brown with dried blood. The man's bare foot was pressing Elaine's purse to the ground, as if crushing a small animal. I will give you the flame, the Saturnine muttered. I offer you the mist. The Saturnine raised his knife high to slash down at Elaine. Is some flame, you bastard. Honest this, Bill shouted to make him turn his way. The Saturnine whirled to confront Bill, his face a caricature of atom-warped savagery, teeth bared, red foam coming from his nostrils. He threw the knife as Bill dodged to the left. The knife slashed at his right shoulder, just a razor-thin cut, and Bill shot the pagan point-blank in the chest. The Saturnine swayed, went to his knees, and flopped face down. Sophie was sobbing, her hands covering her eyes. Elaine jerked her purse from under the dead man's foot, pulled out the pistol, slung her purse over her shoulder, and with a look of steely determination in her eyes that Bill admired, pulled Sophie to her feet. Come on, baby, Elaine told her. We're getting the hell out of this place. I'm scared, Mama, Sophie said. I know the feeling, love, Bill said, giving the child a quick hug. But you'll like the surface world. Don't believe what you've heard about it. Come on. They were surprisingly close. 
Bill, Elaine, and Sophie were hurrying up to the open bathysphere that would take them up the shaft to the lighthouse, to where Wallace should be waiting. A rogue splicer slid down the cable, jumping off the bathysphere's top and tumbling through the air like an acrobat. He landed on his feet in front of Bill. The splicer wore a small, harlequin-style New Year's Eve mask, splashed with the blood of the body he'd taken it from. He had long, dirty brown hair, a streaked red-brown beard, and glittering blue eyes. His yellow teeth were bared in a rictus-like grin. He, that's me, and oh, that's you. <laughs> he leaped from left to right and back again, blur fast, an elusive target. Look at the little girly girl. I can sell her to Ryan, or keep her for play, and maybe a quick bite. He had a razor-sharp curved fish-gutting blade in each hand. Sophie whimpered in fear and ducked behind her mother. Elaine and Bill fired their pistol at the splicer almost simultaneously, and they both missed. He leapt in the air, flipping over them and coming down behind. Sport boost, and lots of it. The rogue splicer was spinning to slash at them, but Bill was turning at the same time, firing. The bullet cracked into one of the curved blades, knocking it away. The splicer slashed out with the other blade, which cut the air an inch from Sophie's nose. Enraged, Bill forgot his gun and rushed at the splicer, shouting, BASTARD! He just managed to duck under the swishing blade to tackle the splicer around the middle, knocking him onto his back. It was like tackling a live wire. There was not a gram of fat on the splicer. He was all muscle and bone and tension, and Bill felt himself overbalanced and quickly flung off. The splicer leapt up stood grinning down at Bill, throwing the hooked blade before Bill could fire his pistol. Bill twisted aside, felt the curved knife shear a piece of skin from his ribs. Then there were three quick gunshots, each one making the splicer take a jerking step back. The third one went through the splicer's right eye, and he went limp, falling on his back, feet twitching. Bill turned, panting, to see his wife with the gun in her hand, a wild look in her eyes. Sophie was clinging to her mother's leg, face buried in her hip. You're a bloody fine shot, love, he told Elaine. And thank God for that. I had a good teacher, she said numbly, staring at the splicer's body. Come on, into the lift. Elaine nodded and took Sophie into the bathysphere. Bill climbed in after them, found the release hidden under the control panel, and activated it. They took the bathyspheric lift up the shaft, out of the undersea, the three of them riding up into the lighthouse. Bill had cut power on the security bots and turrets guarding his way out through the lighthouse this morning, but he was afraid they'd come back on, somehow, to greet his family with a spray of bullets as soon as they stepped out of the bathysphere. But only quiet greeted them at first, when they stepped out, and the echo of their footsteps in the dome. Sophie looked around in awe, stunned by the naked daylight coming through the entrance to the lighthouse, the unfamiliar sound of breakers outside. Then, eyes wide in fear, she stared up at the enormous, electroplated bust of Andrew Ryan, glaring back down at them. Ryan seemed to be holding up a banner, yellow lettering on the red field, reading, No gods or kings, only man. It's Mr. Ryan, Sophie gulped, stepping back. He's watching us. It's just a statue, Elaine said. Oh, but she's right, said Head Constable Cavendish, coming around from the other side of the bathysphere. Bill spun, raising his gun, but then he saw that Karlowski was there too, and Redgrave. They all had Tommy guns at the ready in their hands. Redgrave was pushing a despondent Roland Wallace who had his hands bound behind him. If Bill fired, the constables would return fire, and Elaine would likely be hit. And Sophie. He couldn't get all three of them. Bill lowered his pistol, then let it slip from limp fingers to the floor. Drop it, lady, said Cavendish, pointing the Tommy gun at Elaine. With a sob, she dropped her gun and clutched Sophie to her. Oh, God, Bill, we were so close. He put his arm around her shoulders. I'm sorry, love. 
I should have found a better way. Karlowski looked grim. Cavendish was grinning wolfishly, but Redgrave looked stricken, uncertain, deeply sad. I tried, Bill, Wallace said. I, I got the boat here, I climbed out to look for you, and then there they were. You don't reckon that Ryan has cameras none of you know about? Cavendish sneered. Especially outside of this place. You think you're the only ones who tried to leave? Others tried. They're big daddies now. The external cameras caught old Wallace here slipping out. Ryan, is he dead? Elaine asked. Her eyes showed hope. Her voice was defiant. Neat, Karlowski said. A headache, but he is strong man. Not so easy to kill. Your man, he did not have nerve to finish job. Couldn't do it, Bill admitted miserably. He was my friend. There was a time he was like another father to me. Redgrave nodded. His voice was husky as he said, I hear that, Mr. McDonough. I sure do. It's the same with me. I'm sorry. I'd like to help you. You're always good to me, but... I know, Bill said. Let me ask you one thing. Did he send you to bring my wife and child in? Or just me and Wallace? Ah. Uh, Redgrave glanced at Cavendish. I heard him say... Stop Bill McDonough and that traitor Wallace. That's all he said. He does not want anyone leaving, Karlowski said. Now, all three of you, turn around. We tie your hands. You go with us. We all go back down. Bill looked at Karlowski. I'll take what's coming to me. You can tell him anything you want about my girls. Tell Ryan the splice has got him. Cavendish snorted. Karlowski's not doing any goddamn thing of the sort. Bill went on, looking steadily at Karlowski. We got drunk together, you and me. Karlowski, more than once. Christmas Eve's holidays, long nights with vodka. We fought side by side in battle. Karlowski licked his lips. Comradeship mattered to Karlowski. What's this horse shit? Cavendish growled, seeing Karlowski hesitate. You three turn around, like he said. Yeah, Bill said. Elaine, Sophie, turn around, just do it. Their eyes welled with tears. His wife and child turned, and Bill locked eyes with Karlowski. What do you say, mate? One favor. I know you can't let me go, but you can let them go. With Wallace. Redgrave looked back and forth between them, looking like he was trying to make up his own mind. Cavendish frowned. What's all this horse pucky? Come on, let's move. Stop wasting time. Karlowski, you damned Russian drunk. Karlowski raised his eyebrows at that, looked thoughtful, but at last he shook his head. No, Bill. Sorry. Too risky. Redgrave sighed and pointed his gun at Karlowski. Ivan, this man here and his wife had me over for supper more than once. Only white people in this place that done that. I can't let Bill leave Rapture, but we didn't get no orders about his family. Cavendish snarled, twitched his gun towards Redgrave. You black-assed son of a- But that's when Karlowski turned and shot Cavendish in the side of the head. Two shots. Blood and brains splashed as Cavendish jerked sideways took a shaky step, and fell. Bastard. Tuh! Karlowski said, spitting on the body. Elaine and Sophie screamed, clutching at each other. Wallace stared in dull amazement. Right, Karlowski. Elaine looked around to see what had happened, but she kept Sophie turned away. Karlowski glared at Redgrave, then looked down at Cavendish. I don't like to be pushed around. Redgrave, Karlowski said. But Cavendish, he was asshole. Wanted to kill him many times. And anyway, if anyone is going to insult you, will be me. Elaine turned slowly to them. 
clutching Sophie to her. She winced at the sight of Cavendish's shattered head and said, Mr. Redgrave, can't you let Pill go with us? Please? Elaine asked. Redgrave shook his head apologetically, swinging the gun towards Bill. I'm sorry. Bill and Wallace got to come with me. I understand, Bill said, meeting Redgrave's eyes. Mind the one who gave you a chance. It was the same with me. The launch is idling out there, Miss McDonough, Wallace said in a dead voice. Bottom of the stairs. All you got to do is cast off. Press the drive lever. Head straight on the way it's pointing right now. That'll take you to the sea lanes. Someone will see you. There's a flare gun in the launch. Elaine was turning to Bill, stunned. No. Bill? Bill took her hand and kissed it. Elaine, my love, you know what you have to do now. For Sophie. Elaine shook her head. Bill stepped closer, kissed her tear-stained lips. Then he pushed Sophie into her arms. For Sophie. Her mouth buckled, but she nodded just once. Face white, lips trembling. Elaine took Sophie by the hand and walked away from him. They walked past the bathysphere, toward the corridor, leading to the stairs. What, what about Daddy? Sophie asked as they went, her voice quavering. We'll talk about it later, hon, Elaine said. Daddy has, Daddy has some business right now. Bill's daughter looked back over her shoulder at him. Bill tried to fill his mind with the last sight he would have of her. Goodbye, love, he called, waving once. Your old dad loves you. Then Elaine pulled Sophie along with her, through a doorway, and out of his sight. Karloski looked at Bill, then nodded towards a nearby window. Bill walked to the window. Through it he could see sun sparkling on sea. Blue sky, white clouds sailing by. He waited, men with guns behind him, watching him. After a few minutes he saw the small vessel moving on the surface of the sea, away to the northeast, to the sea lanes. Bill felt a hand on his shoulder. Yeah, let's go, he said, turning away from the window. The four of them got into the bathysphere, Karlowski and Redgrave keeping their weapons on Bill and Roland Wallace. I'm sorry, Roland, Bill said. This is my fault, mate. Roland shook his head. I was going to try it anyway. Not your fault. Proud to know you, Bill. When they got to the bottom, there were three more constables waiting. Take this one to Suchong, Karlowski said, shoving Wallace toward them. Wallace went meekly with them. What are they going to do with Roland? Bill asked softly. Who knows? Redgrave said sadly. Bill tried to think about escape, but all the fight seemed to have drained out of him. He knew he wouldn't see his baby girl or his wife again. And Karlowski was good at what he did. He'd never let Bill get by him again. Bill walked ahead of Karlowski and Redgrave to the metro. The journey to central control was like a journey back in his mind. More than ten years in rapture. New York City, London, the war. That boy being sucked out of the shattered fuselage of the plane. He'd always felt bad, surviving when that kid had died, that young man, and other men. Friends who'd gone down burning in bombers. Well now, he had a chance to be with them. They reached central control and he found himself in the shadow of the dead. He looked up to see the decayed corpse of Frank Fontaine stuck on a stake, 
like a Jesus who missed the resurrection boat. Ryan had the body crudely sewn up, brought here, and posted. A message to his enemies, which is what Bill was about to be. Karlowski handed Redgrave his machine gun and drew a pistol from under his coat and stepped behind Bill. Bill heard the sound of Karlowski cocking the gun. Supposed to crucify you before killing, Karlowski remarked. But... I always liked you. So... Quick then. I guess I should have killed Ryan, Bill said. His voice sounded thick and unnatural in his own ears. He must be gloating.